Hi, and welcome to the mini training video sessions for Australian dairy manufacturers. My name is Michael Kalish, and I'm your presenter today. And today we're going to be going over project management for food safety systems. Uh, so for developing, uh, implementing, and maintaining food safety systems, we're going to be having a focus on development. Um, and I look forward to showing you exactly how we uh, expect, or I really should say, recommend businesses to manage these complicated projects. So I'd like to start off with a question. Do you have a method for managing complicated food safety projects? If you do feel you do, then you may, act, you may find that there's some perspective here in this presentation. If you don't, I hope you find some inspiration. So when we're thinking about a food safety system, we're ordinarily thinking about obviously making safe food, but there's also a number of different expectations for us. It might be uh, regulatory requirements, um, so uh, the food safety code that applies to us. We might be concerned about a third party audit coming up for a certification, in which case we have a number of different, uh, a huge variety of audit criteria that would apply to us. And then, like I mentioned before, you might have some company standards for safe food. So all these things like clouds are kind of hovering over you. How do we get organized and attack these things in a methodical way? Um, so I use something called a blueprint, and I'm going to introduce you to that uh, and generally how it's made up. Um, the first step is to list all the requirements. If it's the, uh, if it's the food, uh, food safety code, I would start from the top and work my way to the bottom, sticking section to section. Um, you don't have to have just one column for this. You could have multiple columns, so it's easier to navigate. Um, I would also include my certification audit criteria and any company standards I have. Next is identify your evidence. I normally have a few different columns for this. It could be a, a column for policies, for procedures, for forms, and other kinds of documentation that you might, you might use to demonstrate your conformance or compliance with uh, code and criteria. The next column would be your to-do list. So for each and every requirement, we have a plan of attack. And so it's, it's very difficult to juggle 200, 300 different um, pieces of an audit. Um, so the nice thing about putting it into a table like this, and you can use really any Excel spreadsheet you'd like. Um, could be a Google Sheet or a ex Microsoft Excel Sheet, where you essentially lie out the requirements, you lie out your evidence, and you create your to-dos. Table is not the best way to manage a project necessarily, but there are some uh, pretty cool tools out there that you can use. Um, and I'll introduce you to some of them. Next column is who's responsible. So uh, accountability is a really big part to managing a project. So if you have a to-do list, delegating will be the next step. And lastly is to check the status. When is it complete? Uh, if, if, if you're like me, you've probably had the experience of giving some people some tasks and then seeing them drop off the face of the earth. Right? You might check and say, hey, how's that task going? They say, oh, it's, it's, it's going. But you have no idea how far along they are. And if you ask too much, you become uh, a real pester. So um, here are a couple ways that you can lay out your tasks in an organized way where you can start considering real-time collaboration with your staff. There are two popular methods. One is using a Gantt chart. And this is, uh, as you can see above, it's tasks are sort of, uh, they start in the top left and they move to the, to the bottom right. And you can't do the second task before you've done the first task. So you can see here with the lines that I've, articulated some dependencies. This task is dependent on that task. And so they do have to be approached in a certain order. A sprint board or a scrum board, uh, you'll see me use both words here, uh, both expressions, is where you have a to-do list and then you have a sprint list. This sprint backlog is a list of things you're committed to do over the course of a sprint. A sprint is normally uh, more than three days, less than a month, it's a period of time where you're determined to get a, a number of things done. Right? And at the end of a sprint, you would then reflect and then start a new sprint. This is uh, called an iterative process. In other words, um, you learn at the end of every sprint, you reflect on what you, how well you performed and what you could do to perform better. Um, and then lastly, there's a done pile. This done pile is where when tasks are dead, when you have completed them, and, um, and they're never gonna come back, they go into a done pile. So very simplistic. Uh, these do have um, pros and cons. 
a Gantt chart is really great for visualizing those dependencies, which I mentioned before. Also, you can look ahead at the deadlines and you can sort of reverse engineer what you need to get done before that deadline. Um, it, does um, it does allow you to estimate essentially the duration of tasks, so how much time you can afford for each and every task. And that's actually a part of what's wrong with this system. So the cons here are the timelines are often very unrealistic. These timelines don't consider um, health problems. They don't consider uh, just those variables out there in the world that might throw your business off or into a loop. Um, and also whoever is managing the Gantt chart, oftentimes because the timeline is unrealistic, will lose a lot of time adding new tasks and modifying existing ones. And so this does become sort of a time loss, uh, a source of time loss over time. Some people love it. Executives love this kind of stuff. Of course, they're never very accurate. So there has been some pushback on Gantt charts in the last couple of decades, especially in the tech industry, which uses oftentimes something like this, a sprint board, a scrum board, and there are pros and cons too. So the pros here are it's highly accommodating for unexpected turns. Um, the to-do list is, is a mix of to-dos and, and at the beginning of each and every sprint, you are uh, reprioritizing what it is you need to be working on. So new tasks can come up, old tasks can disappear. You're constantly reprioritizing each and every week to make sure your company's focusing on the most important task that there is. There's also no need for technology. There are great technologies out there. Um, all you need to do is look up Scrum or Scrum Board, and I'm sure you'll find something. Trello.com is a great example of one. It's very simplistic, and I personally like it on a wall because it's very tactile. The company, everyone in the company can see it, and when it doesn't move, it's very, very apparent. Um, the cons are if you want to estimate duration of a project, um, it's a little more complicated. I'll show you how we estimate durations of projects using this method later on in the presentation. As you can see here in this to-do list, there's no priority. So one of the first steps with a Scrum board is taking all of those tasks and organizing them top to bottom so you can express higher priority and lower priority tasks. Oftentimes the really big tasks fall to the bottom because they're so big you can possibly get them done in time by the end of a sprint. So it's a good idea to break up those really big tasks and make them into smaller tasks. That way you can see some movement across the board. So uh, when I talk about the size of tasks, um, in Scrum, they attribute uh, more numbers than this, but I'm gonna make it simple for you and, and call it small, medium, and big. So if a task is small, we give it a, a point weight of one. If it's medium, it's three. If it's big, it's five. This is a simplistic version of Scrum. So um, bear with me on this one. Um, with points uh, assigned to tasks, we can then estimate how many points we have in a project. So here you can see I have, a, I have a project with a weight of 155, and I haven't gotten anything done, I'm not doing anything now. All right, but on Monday, we have what we call a sprint planning meeting. This is normally going to take somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, where we're essentially evaluating all the to-dos, we're prioritizing them, and we're identifying those which we're committed to finish by the end of the sprint. And in this case, you can see I've taken 20 points worth, which happen to be five tasks. So I have some small ones and I have some big ones. Okay. Um, Tuesday through Wednesday, uh, this is where I have five minute daily standing meetings. Scrum is intended not to be intrusive. It's intended not to involve micromanaging. And because you're a team, it's, it's hard to throw anyone under the bus. Everyone's working together. The idea is we meet less but, uh, uh, for less amount of time, but we meet more often, okay? And when we're in these meetings, we're only asking two fundamental questions. What are you gonna work on today related to the sprint? And what do you think is slowing you down? How can we make you faster? Okay. So it's a very simplistic uh, uh, meeting. At the end of the week, and a sprint doesn't have to be a week long. It can be two weeks long if you think you more, need more time than this. But I'm going to say here on Friday, we have what's called a retrospective. This is where we talk about our feelings about the project, how well it's moving, generally what can be improved. It's a good time also to review those uh, impediments we discussed uh, Tuesday through Thursday. 
And here you can see I was able to get 18 points done. I still have two points left. So I didn't quite hit my mark, but um, I might take fewer points next time to make sure I get it all done. Okay, so that's generally how it is intended to work. Now, how can I estimate how long my project's gonna be? Well, we know that we have 155 points in the example I gave you. Um, and we know that we're moving at a specific rate. We call that velocity. In this case, I took a much bigger project. You can see here it started off with just about 600 points. And I have a velocity, uh, in other words, I'm accomplishing moving to the done pile, about 20 points, then a little more than 20 points, up to, 20, up to uh, a good number of points uh, each week. So in my sprints, I'm being very productive. I'm even becoming a little faster. And the idea here is you're learning uh, after each sprint uh, how you can remove barriers, you can remove impediments, and operate faster. Okay. The last step is when you're done with all your to-dos is to double check that all of your evidence in indeed does demonstrate compliance. And so this is obviously a, a responsibility due to uh, quality assurance uh, or someone in the organization that has a real good command over the audit criteria or regulations applicable to you. So this is the last step, checking that all your to-dos were in fact able to accomplish the job. So where things go wrong here is where you have uh, an absence of vision. So somebody essentially laying out, you know, this is what's a priority. This is what's not a priority. In the absence of that, in the absence of vision where we're going, we often experience confusion. Where there's a lack of skills. So if you have somebody who really doesn't feel comfortable writing, maybe they don't feel good about the writing skills because they're underdeveloped. You can really see anxiety come out in different ways in your team. If you lack incentive, if everyone's on salary, now they're just spending four or five more hours with you, um, there may be some resistance because they feel that they're not being compensated. There are other reasons for that too. Frustration comes about where there's a lack of resources. So if you run out of post-its to put on the wall, that's a little frustrating. Also it might throw a wrench into your way of managing the project. And lastly is the treadmill, where there's no action plan. What are we gonna work on next? What should we work on now? When somebody asks that question, you're really not doing yourself a good service. You're actually slowing down your team. You should have a backlog of things ready to go. If you wanna learn more about the application of Scrum, I recommend you to Jeff Sutherland's book or the Scrum Guide, which is available for free online. And this goes into a little more detail how you might apply Scrum in your organization. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.